in the midst of an immense spiritual awakening, more and more people are questioning the orthodox way of life. The sleeping giants are emerging from their slumber with their eyes wide open and hunger in their hearts for the truth. I Can Planet presents The Big Awakening, the UK's biggest truth conference. Don't miss Michael Tassarian, Pierre Sabac, Robert Green, Ian R. Crane and Lee David at the Middleton Arena, Manchester, June the 18th, 10 to 10. Tickets available at iCanPlanet.com. Hello and welcome to iCanPlanet.com. I'm Matthew Stevens, and thanks for everybody for taking the time to tune in with us this evening. Tonight, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our special guest, a scholar armed with an immense body of knowledge and an incredible intellectual understanding of many subjects relating to the occult agenda of the Illuminati. He has dedicated much of his life to exposing the New World Order and revealing many hidden truths that are intentionally concealed from us by the illumined priests that operate behind the veil. Many have scratched the surface on the true history of the arcane mysteries and their influence and control on modern day civilization, but few have dared to dig as deep as tonight's guest. He'll be headlining the Big Awakening Conference on the 18th of, 18th of June down at the Middleton Arena. Without further ado, Michael Tassarian. Welcome to the show, Michael. Oh, Matthew, thank you very much. Pleasure to be on. It's great to, uh, to catch up with you. How have you been? Okay. Yeah, busy, but uh, fine, sure. Fantastic. Looking forward to um, the 18th, uh, work, working with you on the conference there, Michael. That's uh, coming up quick and fast, so should be fantastic. Do you know what you're, uh, you're presenting on at the moment? Yes, it'll be on, uh, you know, again, 2012, post-humanism, sort of like a, almost a continuation from my age of manipulation talk uh, we did last year. Uh, that focused a little bit more on symbolism, but we did touch on many other areas, as my work always does. This time we'll uh, go a little bit less on the symbolism because I've covered that so thoroughly and look more now at what this global village concept is about, what uh, constitutes it, looking again at the ingredients of uh, transhumanism, posthumanism, what exactly causes this, well, one, one, what causes the global elite to do what they're doing, but then also looking, which is my speciality, is looking at what we are doing uh, as quote unquote the slave to uh, perpetuate this. This is an area that I don't think a lot of people are looking at enough. Um, mm. I've always said that people leave consciousness at the door. This I think is an absolutely fatal mistake because the people in control are have lots of power. Their power is in many areas, but in my reading of this whole problem, their power lies mostly in the knowledge of the human psyche, be it the ancient psyche and certainly the current psyche. And they have their fingers on that pulse. And therefore, if we don't factor in certain amounts of uh, philosophy, certain amounts of psychology, you know, we're, we don't stand a chance. Mm -hmm. This, this uh, fight is a fight that will be won through intelligence and imagination. And I don't believe we're up to speed yet on the intelligence. We're doing great. I must say I'm not a pessimist. We're doing fantastic. I believe this is an age of answers. I believe that... Um, We've never had the opportunity before to find out what has been concealed from us. Uh, however, one has to always add that answers are only available to those who ask the right questions. So even though we are in a certain, from a zodiological point of view or just from an epochal point of view, a historical point of view, I do believe we're in the age of answers. But it still comes down to the individual asking the question the right questions, and then something else again. You're not Because a lot of people can say, I want the truth, but not many people are willing to walk the road. Not many people have enough guts to take those answers. So you can divide ma mankind into four categories, basically. Those who want the truth and those who don't. And we know who the ones who don't are. That's the masses of the world. And then you still have another subcategory, which is those who want the answers at any cost. And those who say they want the answers, but when they find out there's a price to pay, like hard work, time, deliberation, sacrifice, well, they're out of the picture. They, they, take a, they take a powder. So there's really four, two basic categories of people, which is those who want the answers and those who don't, and then sub, two subcategories. Those are willing to put their life on the line for those answers and do whatever it takes to follow that up. And then you have a whole bunch of other people who find out, oh, Jesus, that's too much work. Uh, I can't be bothered with that. Where's my beer? You know, where's the mm -hmm. remote control? So even in this so-called conspiratorial movement, 
we have a lot of those people still. We're still not quite there yet. There's a lot of people saying lip service, saying they want the answers, but again, they're not really willing to do the work at all so far. And you think this will change um, and, and elevate um, at a quickening pace as we move up to 2012, do you, Michael? Well, yes, the people like yourself are doing fantastic work like yourself. And let me add a personal note of thanks for, again, putting on this marvelous conference. It's always a pleasure for me to come to England. I always have a great time. And I find that is very special because, you know, you can actually write yourself up as one of the very few people who's even bothered to do that, to go the distance. It's exactly what I'm saying is that mm. England should be having conferences like this every other weekend. And they're not. It's very far and few between. So, again, my first statement's are very much pertinent to what you're doing, which is that you have taken that next step. You are putting out the effort. You are making a sacrifice. You are believing in the stuff, and you do want answers at any cost, you know, and that's what it takes. Everybody else just wants to, you know, you, you know, tell me all about it for free and also just sit back and accept it and really don't do anything about it. Yeah. One has to get up and do something about it as well, create a forum, create a podcast, create a website, disseminate information, Long before the internet, you know, I was out there putting leaflets up on, you know, grocery store uh, boards and handing them out in the streets and uh, leaving little flyers here and there where I thought people might want to, you know, read it, like the occult history of America or right. you know, whatever it might have been. You know, so mm. I've been doing it. That, I've been doing that actually longer than I was known. I got known only from from about you know maybe what 2000 or something like that. But from 1990, as soon as I arrived in the shores of America, you know during Desert Storm. That's what we were doing. So just as long as I've been known, equal amount of time, 10 more years, I was literally doing it on the grassroots level, right. just going to bookshops and leaving flyers and, and printing out things at Kinko's all night long. This is a place you do it in America, you know, going at night because it was cheaper to print individual mm -hmm. copies and staying there all night. A friend of mine, we'd print as much as we could from these obscure books and hoping to give them out in, in the streets or even, you know, put them in, in public places. So, Again, it takes the passion and it takes the guts and it takes to not have everyone else do it for you, you know. But yeah. yes, I agree. I think it is going forward. As I said, I am an optimist and I'm rational enough to, practical enough to say we're in the early stages of it yet. But I just also am realistic to realize there's, a, you know, quite a, still a long way to go. And we must, must, must bring consciousness into it. So my talk will focus a great deal on that, the, the aspects of how consciousness is manipulated, the psychic dictatorship, how does this whole uh, architecture of control work on us emotionally and psychically and psychologically? Basically, that's the focus. Great stuff. I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. And let me add to um, to your comment and your kind words there. It's an honour to work with you as well, mate, and to have uh, you know yourself come and uh, speak on our platform that we're uh, providing for speakers. So, yeah, great. Um, let's crack on. Uh, Michael, tonight um, we discussed we were going to, uh, have a little chat about uh, Lucifer because uh, it seems there's quite a common misunderstanding and misconception of what Lucifer actually is or uh, represents. Um, so I was hoping you could maybe break this down a little bit for us and show us where the um, the misunderstandings come from, you know. Oh, yes. Well, I mean, that's a fantastic subject and I'm glad you asked the question about it because I haven't had the opportunity to really get into it. I mean, I've gone into it thoroughly in my Irish Origins book. And on the Ar Irish Origins website, there's also a, an appendices page getting into this thing because Luciferianism is nothing evil at all. Uh, uh, it, the Luciferians are evil. Let's get that straight. But Luciferianism is merely the worship of light, the worship right. of the sun originally, and then the worship of light. And uh, so it uh, certainly is an esoteric subject. Hmm. Um and Luciferian is a noun. It refers to the Illuminati. It refers to the ancient Atonists. Uh, they can also be known as the Princes of Light, which is the term that I use for them. Mm. The term that they use for themselves is Gaonum, which is extremely elite, very, very high level Princes of Light that either have ideological or biological um, uh, uh, heredity going back to the solar cults of the ancient world. Mm. So there's that. There's the principle that this would that word refers to a cabal of worshippers of light. Mm. Uh, I mean, this is long before you make a value judgment about what they're up to and whether yeah. they're good or they're bad or whatever, because, you know, presumably solar worship is a very ancient thing. Not everybody who's been into it is some sort of dark, uh, you know, uh, creature from the slime, you know, who's, who's trying to manipulate the human race. Mm. Solar worship is a very positive thing. Christianity is nothing but solar worship, as many of the other religions are. Um, so there's nothing inherently wrong with the worship of light. 
but the cult of Luciferians or this Gaonum or these Levites or whatever, Illuminati or whatever terms people want to use, I, I also refer to them as the Black Lodge, they have a particular understanding of light. Uh, you can get this clearly from even their own writings. Hmm. But, and I refer to it that they are worshippers of really what you might want to call the dark side of the sun. And that's okay. because they are fully understanding, they fully understand that light can be used as a weapon. Uh, that light has extremely destructive principles in the sense that if you go out and stand and look at the sun because you admire its beauty, probably you'll lose your eyesight. It'll burn your retina out. So just on that simple principle alone, physically, we can understand that light has enormously powerful destructive properties that not only warms us and heats us and lights us, it can scald, it can burn, and it can desiccate. You know, uh, so there's there's lots of things about light that we don't understand and how it's being used as a weapon is fully understood by these this particular cabal. Mm. But then again, stepping out of that uh, module, the word Lucifer is always, from a traditional point of view, considered identical with Satan. And my work is to try and show that that's there's no there's no equivalency at all. They're not the same thing in in any sense of the word. Right. And that's just from stupidity from these uh, biblical commenters. And I have to say that these people, most Christians and most Jews. Uh, most people of official religions have the foggiest idea where their religions come from, who's behind it, uh, what it's all about. And this is made more mysterious, I think, when you find out that these people who have, who have habitually taken the Bible literally, mm. which means that they actually do believe that there's yeah. a frolicking, uh, frolicking uh, man and woman in the Garden of Eden who got tempted yeah, by yeah. a serpent, need I go on, you know, they actually take this literally. Well, then I'd say to them that why don't you take Matthew thirteen thirty four literally, the passage that says, all these things spake Jesus unto the multitude in parables, and without a parable spake he not unto them. Mm. And if that's some sort of a, an, to an, an, uh, the language of that is too antique for people, well, then we just go to the the, the Basic Bible English, and it simply means all these things Jesus said to the people. He did so in the form of stories, and without a story, he did not say anything to them. So, all right, so you take the Bible literally. Mm. Go ahead. Now's your moment. What does the passage say? He says that Jesus spoke in parables and metaphors and allegories. Uh, could astrotheology be one of those allegories? Could Masonic or alchemical symbolism be one of those uh, levels of parable? Could psychology of a kind, could 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 Kabbalah? Hmm. Hang on a minute. <laughs> in, the, in the upper echelons of both the Christian Church and Judaism, they have Kabbalistic tuition. They have Kabbalistic grades. Within Masonry, they have it. Could Jesus be talking in power? Is that, is that what that means? Because it's right there. Take it literally, all you literal people. That the Bible cannot be taken. No part of the Bible. No part of the Scriptures. Now, certainly that that part which is New Testament can be taken. Literally, gee, hmm. what are we going to do now? You see, so even from their own logic. So then, when you, so when you, to answer your question, then when you say, Satan, Lucifer, what is that? Well, I, that, 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 that's that worm, that's that devilish serpent that tempted Eve and all the rest of it. So this has just been kind of um, associated, just like you know, it's almost like a presumption, isn't it? Yeah. You know, Lucifer and Satan. Oh, they must be the same thing. I mean, how, how is there this connection? Is that just kind of? Lack of research that that people are not looking in the in the ancient texts and what have you, or has there been kind of an agenda to push this that that Satan and Lucifer are one and the same? I believe there's an agenda there. I yeah. absolutely because remember as we're pointing, I'm being somewhat facetious here, but but obviously a brainless fool, let alone anybody who's learned Aramaic and, and, and these Hebrew scholars and these big Christian scholars, they know what I'm talking about. They're not fools. So obviously, why haven't they cleaned it up yet? Mm. I mean. You know, why haven't they cleaned up the fact that uh, even the god is an anthropomorphic male? We've anthropomorphized a male figure with a beard, no less. Yeah. Uh, and this is a really amazing character, this Jehovah. It, I'll come back to this later because it turns out later, hopefully, hopefully we can explore the idea of the connection between Jehovah and Lucifer. But yeah. let's leave that for a second. Because, again, these wonderful biblical stories tell us that this marvelously omnip- omnipotent god, uh, when he's fed up, over the sin that uh, Satan has helped to tempt Eve and Adam, okay, and, they, and then the fall takes place, and God is so, uh, you know, uh, uh, contemptuous of this fact, and so wrathful over it, that he destroys the entire creation, right? Now, yeah. 
This is what the Bible says. Everybody telling you that the whole creation of God was so angry and uh, so uh, indignant. I would say, why didn't he just destroy Satan who caused the, the problem in the first place? Mm. Why, why destroy the whole creation? Why not just get rid of the person that you created who, who tempted? Get rid of the tempter and all is solved. No, keep the tempter well and truly alive. Satan lives. But the whole universe and everything in it, every plant, every person, every uh, animal, the entire creation is, is, is destroyed right, from yeah. God's wrath. But the prime mover... He's, he's, he's good to go. I mean, you know, what, what yeah. on earth are we thinking about here? You know? Well, I mean, that, that's a question that, um, you know, most exoteric um, readers should, should kind of uh, ask themselves. I mean, in itself, that one question should, should kind of um, give them an idea that the foundation of the faith is kind of fragmented, you know. Exactly. And you know, that's not the only one. I mean, I've, I've got a whole chapter in my Atlantis book on these contradictions. If people go to, I think it's the, um, yeah, the Irish Origins website, click on the link to Cursey Graves, and you'll have a lifetime of problems to solve when it comes to these contradictions. We, we, we've got millions of them, not just why, if we only had one or two, mm. yeah, and then, then we would be just merely nitpickers and hair splitters, and any good Christian could turn around and go, shut up, you know, okay, every text has its problems, even scientific volumes that are given to kids in school have errata every now and again, so... You know, don't bash us. There's a couple of uh, there's a couple of uh, anachronisms in the Bible. You know, get over it. But the only trouble is, you see, it's just where do you stop? The whole thing is just a, a total mess, and it it gets more profound when you have this concept regarding Satan. That's not a small thing. You're talking about the universal tempter. You're talking about the guy under everybody's bed. You're talking about the guy that has through through your belief in him, entire nations have been slaughtered. Mm. Uh, you're talking about the guy who has kids and adults shivering in fear that if they bite their fingernails, they're going to go to hell. So this is an enormous concept here. Mm. And when you go into it, you find out that the Gnostics, the Essenes, the Therapeutae, the Mandeans, anybody that was anybody in the time at the formation of Christianity and obviously before, that word only meant opposer. The, the word Satan actually only means opposer. And that can be proven because when Jesus has that line in the Bible, when he's talking to, uh, I think it's uh, Peter, where he says, get thee uh, behind me, Satan. Mm. There's this term, you know, get, be, get behind me, Satan. Yeah. That is simply all he's saying there is, get behind me, you opposer. Yeah. So it's like you saying to somebody who kept, kept, kept contradicting you that day, mm. No, just shut up. Get behind me. Yeah. Because yeah. Satan, Satan meant you're, you keep opposing me. You're taking uh, the rival view here, and I'm, I'm canceling you out. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you to keep it quiet. So uh, there's that aspect. In any kind of a Gnostic meeting or in a scene group when they all gathered together, the Brotherhood, Yeah. and the main person was speaking, just like in the Senate in Rome, just like in the Parliament today, you have the opponent who brings up the opposing point of view. I mean, it's okay. so common. We yeah. have that still in our life today, in our world today. And that being was known as the Satan, the opposer, the rival. That's all it ever meant. <laughs> it just meant that. And so we have that in the Bible. But when you realize then that this word only refers to those who take the opposite or contradictory point of view, you know, we again have a big problem understanding uh, why... Wherefore came the, the horned one and the, and, the, and the you know the cloven hoofs and, and all the other malarkey that, that came yeah. to the family? Yeah. I mean, this is just total fairy tales. This is fiction. We you know we, we're in the realm of the mad here, the realm of the psychotic. Mm. Big power mechanism, eh? Yeah. Well, here I got a quote from Lawrence Gardner on the subject. He says, "Nowhere in the Genesis account is there any mention, uh, direct or indirect, of Satan's involvement." And yet it has become common practice for the church to portray the serpent as an emissary of Satan or even as Satan himself. So the word Satan doesn't even appear in Genesis. Yeah, right. you, you go, on, go over the microphone and start talking to any Christian or the ones that we have in our families. Mm. And they'll just tell you, uh, looking you straight in the eye, that Satan did this and Satan did that in the, in, the, in, the, in the Garden of Eden and so on and so forth. You know what I mean? I mean, it's just unbelievable that mm. that word doesn't even appear there. And this serpent is a completely different concept. Uh, and they don't even need to know that, oh, look, the original Genesis story was the epic of whatever from Babylon and Samaria. You know, we don't even need to get into that, that it was a plagiarized story in the first place, because mm -hmm. that would just send them potty, right? Just <laughs> stick with the Bible, 
and tell them that, that, look, the very recounting that you're giving me of this story doesn't make sense. It's not there in the original text. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you, you know, with regards to Satan, because clearly you, you've, you've broken that uh, connection that's um, so commonly kind of misunderstood. Is there a connection with Satan and Saturn and the Saturnalia cults? Or have I kind of gone yeah. down the wrong road with that? There is, yeah? There is to the extent that Saturn, astrologically and mythologically, is the opposer. Right. Again, nothing evil. It's mm-hmm. just that Saturn symbolism ref- is that adamantine stone. Or the, let's just say... Uh, metaphysically speaking, the Saturn is the unmovable, unchangeable principles of a thing. Okay. Uh, he's lead. He's black. He's time. He's Kali. You know. He's karma. He's death. Mm. He's that which you can do absolutely bugger all about. Uh, you can Venus can embellish, beautify. You know. Mm. Mars can activate. Uh, Jupiter can enlarge. Neptune can dream and give you fantasy and imagination and thrill your inspirations. You see, Mercury can chatter and explain and dissect and uh, and so and create sophistry. And so you have a lot of room for different sorts of players on the stage. But Saturn is the unmovable, unchanging point. You know, mm. it's like the the relic. It's like the dirty Harry who you know how many years go by. He remains exactly that one fixed, unchanging point, the unswaying one, right? Yeah. So, yeah. so that is that person, that's that personality, that's that uh, fixed traditions. Let's yeah. say pr- principles that simply, no matter what you do to embellish it, no matter what you do, can never ever alter or change. So, in that sense, mm-hmm. that's that uh, truth. In one way, that is a definition of truth as well. It's that which is fundamental about you. It's that which is fundamental about the cosmos. Uh, and that's just an incredible study there. So, yeah. and then once you have that great phallic black stone of truth, that Saturnian, satanic, if you will, uh, truth, right? Then everything is is sort of in a way um, measured from that point, and there's nothing that can be done about it. So what you have here is an inversion, like in many aspects, Christianity simply inverted things that have been known for thousands of years. They inverted the horned one. That was nothing more than the forest god, Hearn, for goodness sake. Even Moses has got those horns mm. from the Old Testament. It was such a common symbol of knowledge. In fact, the crown of thorns that Jesus wears is a stylized version of the crown of the antlers of the deer, uh, oh. the great stag god of old, you know, uh, all of this. So, again, they skewed it, they, they misinterpreted it, they twisted it round, and this is why we have this um, vastly great problem because if Satan is Satan in the Christian sense, then why is Jesus talking to Peter and calling him Satan? Mm. If Lucifer is so damn dark and evil, why in many traditions was Jesus known as the star or the rising sun or the morning sun? Why is Mary of Bethany, that's Mary Magdalene, referred to as Lucifer, Mary the Lightbringer? Why is there a character in mythology called Diana Lucifera? In fact, you can find it on Ellis Island. The statue that we know as the Statue of Liberty is literally the statue portraying a goddess known as Diana Lucifera. Yeah. Diana the Lightbringer. This thing is permeates all forms of uh, Catholicism and Christianity. It can be looked up in any reference work. So that then contradicts it, doesn't it? It contradicts this narrow Christian idea that, wait a minute, there's a devil with some horns on his head, you know, uh, and, and a forked tail. I mean, obviously, even from their own tradition, there's there's anecdotes about Satan and Lucifer that contradict that. Mm. And now we're not even talking about the astrotheology yet. One of the interest, most interesting aspects to explain the Satan-Lucifer problem mm. is simply the astrotheological one. Okay. Uh, one anecdote about that is simply that just as I said that uh, Jesus said to Peter, get thee behind me, Satan, that is a direct astrotheological, esoteric anecdote because that's exactly what the priests at the temple of the Eastern Gate, when they looked at the Eastern Horizon every year or possibly even every certain mornings, when the heliacal rising of Mars, Mars has always been considered, again, the opposer, uh, very much identified with Satan and Jehovah, and so the priests would see, or in astrotheological tradition, let's say, the priests at the Temple of Heliopolis and Giza, and even at later stages, they'd look and, and they would have this uh, motto that said, Get thee down, get thee down, Mars, get thee down, Satan. Because what they said is that the star, uh, the star that was trying to rise with the sun, heliacally means as the sun is rising at the horizon, and the light of the sun is about to rise over the horizon, just before that time happens, you see the twinkling of the star Mars. And so that was considered the rivalry, that Mars is trying to be arrogantly 
and uh, flagrantly opposing the light of the Christ, mm. uh, the sun or Atom or Amun or Ra or whoever, or whoever it might have been, right? So they would say, get thee down. Don't try to challenge or rival uh, this. So this was a well-known uh, astrological motto of the priests, again, mm. tying into the fact that Mars, the tempter, the Lucifer, uh, the opposer, was being told, get thee behind or get thee down, get thee lower, bow thy head down, you know, get down on your belly. Don't try to rival the great sun, the great Mithras, hmm. the, the true solar aspect, is it? So, I mean, this is really interesting information. I would love love to kind of um, get into a deeper study of this astrotheology uh, subject matter because, um, you know, it's something I haven't looked at with too much depth. But um, can I just ask, Michael, you know, like you mentioned, uh, say, Armin Ra, uh, Aton, um, Mithras, are, the, are these anthropomorphic gods? I mean, when, when we hear oh, these yeah. names, is that is that kind of a, an anthropomorphic um, character representation of kind of esoteric properties, so to speak? Oh, yes. In fact, the, the very fact that gods became anthropomorphic signals a particular epochal change and the rise of patriarchy, basically. Um, one can argue that before the patriarchal period, when you had more of a mat matriarchal, let's say, or just even more of a pagan concepts, yeah. the, the, the gods were not as anthropomorphized. They certainly weren't as masculine all the time. And they tended to be more hermaphroditic, perhaps even uh, androgynous, perhaps even uh, zoomorphic. Hmm. And we certainly know that's true of Ireland and in, in Egypt. They have that in common where they have zoomorphic gods, gods that are part animal hybrids. Yeah. Not that the... I mean, this is uh, a lot of this again is, is astrological metaphor. Yeah. But when the rise of the solar cult, the hardened solar cultism came about, uh, and then you have the, this sort of move of patriarchy, then you start to see this, and you, that's why you see it in Rome, and you see it in Greece, and subsequently you see it a lot, in which there is this uh, removal of these more um, animalistic tropes and, and 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 motifs, and just the simple masculinization of the god and then his combat against entities or beings that were actually the old gods so in in the new solar cult periods uh you suddenly see the the great hero uh fighting doing combat with gods that are really basically just uh rescriptions of yeah. earlier gods as a matter of fact you know he's the conqueror of the dragon he's the conqueror of uh, some uh entity or he fights these other you see this a lot in the mahabharata of india Okay. Uh, where, where it's actually the older gods that are being deposed. There's a lot of propaganda involved. No different than the coming of Christianity. Right. Okay. Well, I mean, you know, you know, behind um, all of these concepts, there's there's clearly a, a great kind of body of knowledge and intellect um, in regards to um, esotericism, the metaphysical aspect of things, and and very much um, a spiritual and scientific kind of um, aspect as well. Do you know what I mean? Now, would this have come from Lucifer, perhaps, this this kind of knowledge and understanding to, to, to kind of a, apply this almost blueprint map out to kind of give us um, an idea of what is taking place beneath the, uh, the the scenes, you know what I mean? Well, I don't I don't know about that. I'd say that if you, the kind of uh, technocrats who run the world and are looking to create the scientific dictatorship, hmm. And have been working on it slowly. There is no doubt about it that these people can be directly tracked back to the worship of, say, Mithras and mm. Serapis, and uh, and certainly my favorite Aton, you know, the Atonism. Okay. And then when you have done the homework that I've done, like I point out in this Irish Origins book, then you find out that this Aton hmm. is is Lucifer. Right. Um, again, let's hold off on the value judgment and just simply from a purely etymological, purely logical, mythological and historical point of view, yeah. just point out that uh, Aton is Lucifer because Aton is the morning, is the rising sun. When Akhenaten himself physically got up in the morning to worship his son that was called Aten, he did so by looking at the eastern horizon and waiting for the sun to actually rise. That was the holiest moment of the day mm. and they never missed it. And even the city from which, the city that Akhenaten built, it's at the place called Amarna, um, that uh, temple con uh, precinct in which Akhenaten lived uh, was called Akhetaten, 
and Ta Ten is horizon. All right. So the sun at the horizon, and he built the buildings and had the prayer centers and had the temples, you know, facing obviously the eastern horizon, so that every single morning they'd rise up and greet the sun. Mm-hmm. And by the way, just as an anecdote, when the sun would set, I mean, literally go beneath the horizon, regardless of what time it is. I mean, these characters just literally went to bed. They didn't even stay up after darkness. They had such an antipathy to the darkness. But mm. but the point is that uh, this, the, the fact that the sun moving over the horizon was the key moment. Now, if you look at the Discover card, you know, the, the credit card, if you look mm-hmm. at the symbol for Nissan cars and umpteen other corporate logos, you'll see this exact uh principle in a sort of a designer version where you find the horizon and the sun half above, half below this particular meridian point. And mm. you find it in hotels and all sorts of places you find the symbol of the rising sun. And so Aton, that disc, was known as the god of the horizon, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, the god of the morning star, in other words. And that's the very term that is used in not only in the Bible, but elsewhere to re- refer to this Lucifer, the bringer of light, the okay. one who brings light to us. Now, how this becomes extremely intriguing is that you find out then that in the earliest books of the Old Testament, in the old books of the so-called Jews, they don't use the word Jehovah. They worship Jehovah, but they don't use that name. They don't physically utter the name Yahweh or Jehovah for Jehovah. What word did they use is Adon. Mm. A-D-O-N. And that's exactly the same word as Aton. The fact that there's a T and a D, we don't want to, it's quite long-winded to explain all of this, but it talks yeah. about consonants and, and how they change and say the same and so on. But Adonai is the name that the Hebrew rabbis used in ancient times to stand in place of the god Jehovah. Now, if they're using the name of the god of the ancient solar cult of Akhenaten, then we know that there's a tie there. We know that basically, and after you do more homework, you, you, you find out that this Adonai is no is nothing more than a uh, nom de plume, um, a uh, a reference to Aton. Do you mean? Basically, exactly yeah, a reference yeah. reference to Aton, and then then they'll tell you that it, it refers to their Jehovah or Yahweh. Okay. And then you find that the Jehovah is uh, in Hebrew is four sacred letters Yod Hey Vav Hey, and Yod, which is the English J. Sometimes Y, but J. Okay, yeah. That the numerical uh, uh, correspondence is ten. Right. A ten. <laughs> right. Yeah. So the J, the first letter of the God that Christians and Jews worship, is symbolized by the number ten. It's called Yod, and it literally refers to either the one or the ten, but definitely the ten. And so we have ten Downing Street, mm. the House of Aton with the solar disk above the door and a little arrow of Mars. You, you know, my work shows this, that this whole concept is atonistic based. So, Jehovah equals Aton. So, in other words, the God, I mean, like that, we, first of all, wait a minute, I thought we were just studying about Satan and Lucifer. How did God get involved? Mm. You find out that we've been had. And okay. these masons are in stitches. Mm. Because, uh, and, and let me elaborate the point, because is it not true that within the so-called conspiracy movement, a very great proportion of them, they call themselves the truth movement, mm-hmm. are right-wing Christian. Yeah, yeah. And is it not true that those right-wing Christians, God love them, is it not true that they are doing their utmost best to get rid of the evil Illuminati and the evil Freemasons? Mm, yeah. Right. Okay, then in steps Michael Fasson with a bit of a question. <laughs> How the hell do you do that when they are your creators? When the gods you worship is the same God that they worship. And you can, when Albert Pike and these people are writing about, uh, what did he say, you know, we worship Lucifer, we have, I've got quotes from rabbis, I'll find it in a minute, where he's telling the Jewish congregation, be under no illusion, we don't like to admit it, but our God is Lucifer. Mm, I mean, it's quite out there now, isn't it, in the public domain, that, that this, this is the case, you know, Freemasonry at the, the top level, the hierarchical level, you know, that the God is Lucifer, isn't it, you know? Right. Yeah, in fact, here it is, I found it. Harold Wallace Rosenthal, interviewed in 1976, says that most Jews do not like to admit it, but our God is Lucifer. Christians who immediately try to, you know, hide behind the pews at this moment. No, 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 no. He's not saying anything evil. He doesn't mean Lucifer in the evil way. He means it in exactly the way Albert Pike meant it. Our God is Adonai. Our God is Aton. Our God is Jehovah. What's your problem? And then you go to Adam Weishaupt, head of the Illuminati. Right? What does he say? Freemasonry is hidden Christianity. At least my explanations of the hieroglyphics fits this perfectly. 
And in this way in which I explain Christianity, no one need be ashamed to be a Christian. Well, what the hell do they know that we don't know? On paper, again, shoddy scholarship, mm. are trying to tell you that, number one, these, uh, these Illuminati were anti-monarchy, anti-royalist, mm. totally a pack of lies. And yeah. two, that they're anti-Christian, totally a pack of lies. The leader's telling you we're Christians. You need not be ashamed to be a Christian. I'll accept anybody because we're all in the same coterie together. And I'm only mentioning Pike and uh, Weishap. You can go through all of these writings of these leaders and all these Masons, and they have no problem. The first thing you see when you walk into a Masonic hall is the Bible open. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and half the, half the uh, malarkey that they're into is based on uh, Masonry. I've done an elaborate series of interviews called The Brotherhood of Death on this to show how incredibly entwined these things are. Mm. So what they're talking about is, is that their God and Lucifer are one. I didn't yeah. say that. They're saying it. So no, nobody else can refute this. It is simply a statement of fact. Uh, and the fact that it's not widely known doesn't change the fact that it's a truth. And okay. then we realize the word sorry, Satan sorry. doesn't even enter into it at all. This is a complete misnomer, right? Then you start coming upon the truth that this, they do this because they're worshipping the sun, and the sun is up there, so it's astrotheology that you're into. And then you understand that then astrotheology becomes the basic hermeneutic key to open the door to all these other conundrums. You see, as I said, we're in the age of answers, and if you have the guts to accept the answers, which means, possibly means a sacrifice of what you first believed in, well, you're well on your way then. And you will have these tools to open the door to the mysteries of everything that has been, in fact, everything. I'm talking about all the mysteries to everything in life, mm. but specifically that which has been deliberately hidden from us, you will have the answers to. Yeah, and I, I think that's what a lot of people are looking for because um, it's funny, you can kind of get trapped in, in certain areas of study um, by kind of, uh, when you get into a certain point and, and you find you've kind of opened a can of worms um and you, you, you're getting kind of led around the garden path, so to speak. Do you know what I mean? And it's it's almost as if uh, a lot of, you know, like the mystery schools, for instance. Um, it seems that a lot of the mysteries themselves are purely just um, kind of keeping keeping the, the initiates and that are hungry for these mysteries and hidden truths, kind of keeping them in ignorance as they kind of control them directly when there is not really much to, to tell apart from when you're at the higher levels of this. Do you know what I mean? That's right. I, I hope I, that made I, sense. I mean, I was stumbling on my words. I'm just trying to express, um, I don't know. you know. You're right. They have the inner lodge. I have other quotes, by the way, from Albert, from Adam Weishab is saying exactly what you're saying. Mm. And he even says it contemptuously. Right. He says, you you punks that join our order and you think you know shit, you got to go very far up the line and then maybe we'll tell you what it's all about. We're keeping you in ignorance. Mm. Ignorance is the name of the game. And again, outside the lodge, we're still in a hierarchy outside the lodge. It's just that you know there's a bit of a difference. Yeah. But the same rules applies out here. Look, people were coming to Ellis Island from all around the globe, saying we're free. We've arrived in America, looking up at the Statue of Liberty, and not even realizing that that's Diana Lucifera, and the Masons are having a ball. They're absolutely screaming with laughter. That wasn't Milton Berle or Jim Carrey standing there, <laughs> uh, modeled for the Statue of Liberty. Yeah. That is. Diana Lucifera, why that? It's not a giraffe. It's not, it's not, it wasn't Groucho Marx. Where did they get that symbol? Why is it a woman with those seven rays? You know, I mean, does anybody, but the fact is they don't. They're only beginning to wake up to say, why this as opposed to, as opposed to something else? Things that philosophers ask all the time. Why this and not something else? The whole human race has got to start asking this. Why, yeah. why only male and female in the world? Why not three, four, five sexes? Why do we, you know, so the question, the question. And so people can either hide from these great questions, metaphysical or conspiratorial or psychological or whatever. Yeah. Why, the, why, the, why, the, why the stripes on the um, you know American flag and so on? Why all of this stuff? What what do these numbers and these symbols? Why do they have a number ten Downing Street? Why isn't it number fifteen? You know, so I mean, this is the kind of thing that you know I think needs to happen is that people need to really get curious again mm. uh, and then start asking these questions because we are actually in the age of these answers. I mean, why, um, for instance, did you know that one of the earliest, uh, uh, one of the earliest uh, uh, meanings of the word uh, fish hmm. in Old French is loose? Oh, I see. But is, it, is not the fish the symbol that most Christians use? <laughs> it is, yeah. Right. But in Old French, loose, L-U-C-E. And I think even in Scotland they have an equivalent talking about some sort of pike like the famous pike of Scotland, right? Mm. Uh, all the pike fishermen know about that. Well, one of the early names of that fish 
or I think it's a fish very similar, was loose, the loose. And so Lucifer it has another connection to the symbol of the fish. Now that opens up another door.